All right. How's it going? It's going amazing. <laughs> awesome. Um, all right. So yeah, just uh, go ahead and tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Thank you, Carson. My name is June, June Fuchs. Um, I am a mental health and mindfulness coach for vegans and activists. So I work in the fields of mental health, which means I help a lot of vegans and activists out there overcome their frustrations, their anger, their depression, and their anxiety, which are often very common factors for activists and vegans to get stuck and not stay active and not keep inspiring a better world out there, which equals in um, less vegans, which equals in more animals getting harmed. So this is what I do for a living. This is what I've uh, built my business uh, based on. Uh, other than that, I live on Bali by choice. <laughs> I'm a surfer boy. I love the ocean. I'm very often in the waves. I'm actually heading out after this interview. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> right. And um, other than that, I am a long term mindfulness practitioner, which includes various practices such as yoga, meditation, breath work and um, mindful movement practice, also known as ecstatic dance practice. So these are some of the things that I do in my daily life, which uh, cover work, but also joy. And it goes hand in hand for me, like working for me is joy for me. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Um, okay. So you mentioned um, the vegan activists that you work with. Do you, is that just, is that your primary focus because you're focused on vegan, like the idea of veganism or if there weren't, like, let's say you had more openings for people to uh, take in as clients on the topics of like uh, health, uh, mental health, um, would you take other people in or are you specifically just vegan working? Uh, great question, actually. I started out my coaching business with taking in other people as well, which means people that come from any kind of background, any kind of mindset. And I work with those people, yes. At some point I realized though that what fulfills me more is when I work within my own community. And with fulfilling, I mean that it is more aligned with my actual purpose. And my actual purpose or a big part of my purpose is to support veganism because veganism to me means saving lives and doing good to the planet, to the animals and to humans as well, right? Mm -hmm. I believe that veganism is very multifaceted and can have a lot of benefits for all of these areas so i used to work with people from from all these different areas and by begin of this year i actually chose to niche down we call this niching in the coaching world we're niching down to a sector or a specific a specific target client and I was working with a mentor to do that. She helped me out to really nail down who I really want to work with. And that was the biggest question. Who do I want to work with? Who do I want to hang out with anyway? So I figured out that all the learnings that I've learned in my life that have uh, shaped this business of mine, this coaching business, are super helpful for anybody and everybody. So mm -hmm. it's up to me to choose who I really want to hang out with inside of this coaching business. And that's when I made the choice that I want to support my own community thrive um, and my own community. Well, I, I'm a part of different communities. I'm also part of the queer community. I'm a gay man or I identify mm -hmm. currently as a homosexual man. And I'm a part of this whole rainbow community, but I'm also a massive part of the vegan and the activist community since I've been vegan since uh, 2017 and active since the same year as well. And uh, yeah, so that choice has been made out of my heart. Like who do I wanna work with? So gotcha. currently to answer, I only work with vegans and activists, yeah. Okay, gotcha, yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, another question I have for you, is so I've done a fair bit of research um, and, you know, discovering various different things about ideas that could be healthy, you know, meditation, going out in nature more, a lot of things that you'll probably talk about in a second um, that you, you feel are what you would advise people to do. But whenever I make like offhand comments about that being a good place to start, like that kind of thing or exercise, um, when pe before people go in and have doctors give them medicine to uh, get over depression, there's a lot of backlash. A lot of people hate the idea of thinking there could be any connection to nature and exercise. And uh, 
I, I assume there's a mixture, like everybody's different. So some people, nature and exercise might completely just fix them. That's all they needed. They needed a better situation in life where other people, they might need some medication, but if they go in, get the medication and they haven't done anything else, they might be thought of as somebody that needs a lot of medication where if they fixed other areas, they might only need a little medication. But um, so what, um, what, what kind, I guess I kind of want to know a little bit of, uh, did you go to school for it or did you just read a boatload of books? Did you just do a lot of scientific study research? What led you to understand the things that would help with anxiety and depression and things like that? Mm -hmm. Oh, what a beautiful question. <laughs> Let me give a beautiful answer. <laughs> Um, one question that I always had was, uh, do I understand it? And as in, in school, I, I hardly understood science, like chemical substances and stuff that was, it was really challenging for me to understand. And I had to really dig, dig into it to, to at least have good enough grades to pass, you know, but on the other mm -hmm. hand, do I understand nature? That was always easier for me to to kind of sum up because I learned how a tree was growing. It came from a seed. It needed what it needed nourishment, environment, and water. And so that concept was much simpler for me. And I could identify myself with that way faster as a human being, as a part of nature, than as a human being, as a part of chemical processes. Of course, we have them as well. Yet they were just not as tangible, not as understandable for me as nature so what i was looking at when i was learning and studying and with studying i mean i didn't go to university uh, university for any of this i'm a fan of embodied wisdom which means i like to experience the teachings that i teach these days myself so the ways that i've learned is that i went out there and i looked for people that are living what they preach and teach and i asked them to teach me and that came in shape of courses, that came in shape of mentorship, that came in shape of programs, and that came in shape of retreats, right? So I nailed or I pinpoint, pinpointed down these, these people, and some just kind of popped up in my life magically, could say, in the right time. And I just had to ask them, hey, how can I learn this from you? And a lot of them, same like myself to them they, uh, today, they have packaged what, whatever they are teaching inside of an online or an offline offering. And that's how I learned most by experiencing it myself. So that's where I come from when it comes to, to learning, right? And <clears throat> a part of your question also was, um, I guess the balance, right? Like people that go straight to medication, if they feel an issue, if they feel a disynchronicity with I'm not healthy, I'm feeling not good in my body, my mind doesn't work or whatever it is. Um, and finding the natural way. Now, what I've realized up until this moment, both can work. <laughs> like there's no right or wrong. There really isn't. And it's just a question of, um, which approach can you identify more with? Like I personally, as I said, I could always identify more and I understood it more, the simplicity of not how nature, uh, nature works. Now it's not that simple, but to me it was always more simple than like what's inside of this pill. And then there's all these side effects. And when do, there were too many questions for me that needed to be asked before I would swallow that pill. If I could just swallow a capsule with some sort of oil, that I knew, oh, that's a cold pressed oil and it comes from seed A, B, C, right? Mm -hmm. So the relatability and the connection to it is what made me choose to always go for more natural and more organic ways of, of dealing with my past mental health issues because I've been in deep depressions and I've even been in suicidal episodes myself years ago. So that's where I was looking for answers and I found them there. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, cool. Cool. Um, let's see. Let's see. So what, um, I guess what's some of the first advice you usually give people? What if somebody is just 
you know, completely just a mess and they don't know what to do with their lives. Um, well, let, let's start, let's start with somebody. So you work with vegans, but do you work with people that are thinking about becoming vegans as well, or just the ones that are already there? So that's a gray zone currently that I'm kind of like tapping into and finding, okay, how far along the journey do you have to be in order for me to, to vibe with you? Because mm -hmm. when I'm working with vegans and when I'm in these containers with vegans, container means a, um, a program or a vessel where we do work together, which includes a set breath work or meditation, for example, just to explain the word container. And mm -hmm. when I'm in there with them, I want to be as 100% authentic as I can. And especially because they can do that as well. And if you're in the vegan community and if you're having anger as a vegan, you might think things like, gosh, I want to put a bullet through every non-vegan's head. That's a classic mm -hmm. angry vegan thought. Mm -hmm. Don't be shocked if you're not vegan. And if you're hearing this, this is right. things that go through our mind. And I mean, every non-vegan can relate in other ways. You have people in your life where you're like, sometimes I just want to just wanna throw them off a cliff. Mm -hmm. So these are anger thoughts, right? And if in a group coaching online call, somebody has these thoughts and they need to be spoken and looked at, the space that I hold and create is for that. So if a non-vegan is in there who's going to get triggered and scared off and doesn't understand it, then that doesn't work. So for a non-vegan, I could go into a one-on-one -on -one coaching with them, you know, where they are excluded from a group. But for the group, it is important for me that everybody can feel really natural and speak the thoughts, the gnarliest thoughts even. So rarely I pick somebody that's non-vegan to work with unless I can sense and feel and see that they're vegetarian and they're close to doing that switch. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, so what happens if you uh, kind of befriend somebody that you just get along with really well, they're not vegan at all, but because they know you and how you live, they ask you about it. Like what, what do you think of as your first bit of advice for non-vegans? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the same for non-vegans than for vegans. I often go straight to values and I ask questions around values. So values is something we, we can't copy and paste it from other people. We can get inspired by it, but it takes a look within to understand what do I value and what not, what's important to me and what not. And veganism is all about values, right? It's really all about, I value the lives of others. I value the health of the planet. I value other beings. I value my health. Some people are in it for health reasons. Um, and that's where I get started. And a lot of people haven't often asked themselves these questions. What do I really value, right? And regardless if they're vegans or non-vegans, doesn't matter because some vegans ask, ask themselves, what are my values when it comes to compassion, when it comes to living compassion, and then they go vegan for that. But some non-vegans have values around race or gender justice, which is also an, an elevated state of, of living your values, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, what I want to know from people is, are you capable of going inwards and discovering those values? And when we go inwards, we might not only discover values, but we also might discover things we don't like about us, patterns that we're living, shitty habits that we're uh, demonstrating on a daily basis. So the question that I usually ask is, have you discovered yourself really? Like, have you figured yourself out up to an extent where you feel fully balanced and happy in your life? and at peace with yourself. Gotcha. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Um, so uh, while we were talking about that, I thought of a couple questions and I'm just curious where you personally stand. Um, what do you think when it, being vegan, when it comes to different things like, you know, rescuing uh, animals and there being animals that need to be fed non-vegan diets. So we're kind of paying companies to butcher animals to feed them like like cats and stuff like that um where do you where do you stand on that personally and what do you think of it for others as well 
Um, I've observed that everybody draws the line at a different place, and so do mm -hmm. I. So I'm very happy to, to answer that uh, truthfully. Um, I'm a person who goes as far as possible in order to veganize my surroundings. So with as far as possible, we also all, always have a limit. And the limit can be supplies. The limit can be accessibility of products. Mm -hmm. Let's say if you have a dog, we, did, we I share two dogs kind of with my uh, neighbor. They're more her dogs, but we share and we take care of them. And then there's one cat, which is also um, in our environment. She lives with us with uh, another neighbor. And for the dogs, I attempted to try everything to make them eat vegan. And one of them is now fully vegan. That worked. Okay. And the other one, almost. Like he doesn't eat all these vegan dry foods. We cooked vegan for them. Rice, tofu, tempeh, pumpkin eat most mm. of it but sometimes one of these dogs is like too used to it already and it, it it's maybe gonna take a little bit longer so for me it is always like when we're going there because these are the next steps like us being vegan that's the first simple step and then you're going to the next step um i encourage to do that but i'm i feel more patience around it because mm -hmm. it involves more organization than just taking care of myself and my food and the way I eat and consume products, food mm -hmm. and not food. So I think find these steps, make these steps, but at the same time, also be aware that it's work. Like I'm aware mm -hmm. that it's work. We're aware that it's work. And it's actually a lot of work to, to change the whole environment around us. When it comes to the animals we we feed or when it comes to what products we buy like toiletries necessities like i've i've went straight forward from after eating vegan to okay what other products i want all those products to be vegan as 100 percent as i can know mm -hmm. and then the next step is those dogs so take this things step by step because if not i also believe it can get over uh, overwhelming and when we are overwhelmed, we have this natural human reaction of a shutdown and a shutdown yeah. can manifest mentally. We don't think straight anymore or we don't think queer anymore. <laughs> we, we can't think anymore. And that mm -hmm. has a chain reaction to our physical body. We can't move anymore. We feel paralyzed. We sleep more. We lay down in bed more. We breathe less properly. And all of that results in us shutting down towards the outer world and having even less impact. So yeah. find this, this balance of making steps towards veganizing the surroundings, but also be humble and observe, like, is this available to me right now? I'm already taking these steps. I think it's kind of like sums up my point of view on this. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of have issue with that um, sometimes with vegan topics, but sometimes even just regular life stuff where I, I like to go out to a coffee shop, get a coffee and just have that atmosphere of like leaving the house, getting a coffee, having my name written on it and then drinking the coffee. But then I'm just thinking like, if I do this every day, I'm just getting a new plastic cup. That's so wasteful. I could make the coffee at home and not waste anything. And so it's that like decision of what things that bring us joy should we do that might be wasteful because it brings us joy and like how to cut back the right amount. And so it's pretty tricky. I mean, like, as you were talking about various vegan things that would be too stressful to look into everything, I started picturing things like cars. Like I'm guessing most cars probably have pieces of leather or something in there and you can't it's probably not easy to go to a car shop and say, I need a car that has no vegan <laughs> or no animal products in it. Um, but yeah, I, <laughs> I definitely, I draw the, personally draw the line with um, pets. My, my family has a cat that um, my wife had before I met her. And so that cat stayed with us, but I don't buy like cat food for it. But um, I have this thought that like, because humans basically bred, pets to be like the size they are and they can't live out in the wild that it would be nice if at some point we like spayed and neutered all of them let them live out the best lives they can but then stop the existence of these these tiny pets we created especially since so many of them like pugs and stuff can't breathe well it'd be nice if uh 
if we just stopped having pets and if we ever wanted to see animals, we could go on hikes and see animals out in nature or whatever. Um, and until then, yeah. I guess my, my, my go-to thought is if you find a stray cat and you want it to be able to survive, but you don't want to pay people to, to, uh, make cat food for it. You can just find a farm that wants stray cats to like catch their mice, even though it's, you know, it's a bummer. The mice are dying, but it's like an, a natural element versus killing a cow that a cat would never catch on its own and making cat food out of the cow. It's such a bizarre thing. But yeah. <laughs> um same thought pattern here i had the exact same uh thought patterns yeah gotcha, yeah gotcha. um but yeah so um okay so we were talking about the ideas of what we would say to non-vegans so now when it comes to you talking to activists um what what are some of uh, your go-to favorite thoughts that at least work for you but for most people you know for uh releasing uh tension from like uh anxiety and stress and stuff um, there's this beautiful bunch of practices that can be like applied. And my, my coaching program is called become your medicine. And that's exactly what I live for. And what I live is we have the access to become our own medicine by applying or actually not even applying by re understanding how we function with our mind and our breath. So I have a couple of primary tools that I teach and I'm happy to share them here with you, which um, are proven to scientifically release through chemical processes, through, through um, brainwave changing and through nervous system um, regulation. Mm -hmm. They are proven to calm us down and to help us release emotions because I always say emotions are energy in motion unless we hold on to it and let it get stuck. So anger is an energy in motion and emotion. If you haven't heard that before, mind blown. I remember mine was, I was like emotion, energy, emotion, yeah. blew my mind. And we can support this process of keeping that energy in motion until it leaves our body again on these, these um, chemical uh, release triggers uh, coming from the brain and then sent throughout our body, throughout our blood and tensing up our muscles, they can be released. And one of my favorite practices is breath work. It's basically taking ancient wisdom that comes from yoga practices, but also new uh, scientifically proven research and combines it into breathing techniques, right? And they're super simple to apply. So one thing, for example, is to release stress and anxiety, you continuously lengthen your exhales and shorten your inhales. Hmm. So you lengthen your exhales, you exhale longer because the exhale has the effect of relaxing your body and the inhale has the effect of oxygenating your body, which brings energy into your body. And when you're in a mode of anxiety or stress, you have too much energy in your body. So hmm. lengthening your exhales can support the process of calming the anxiety, right? A lot of people always say you got to take a deep inhale, but that's just bullshit because you get more energy into your body and you don't want that. You want to let it out. So longer sure. exhales, for example, right? These are all like a lot of these simple, simple tricks can be applied in the minute to support that process. And then meditation practice. A lot of us have heard of it. I've been practicing it for half a decade, but up until two years ago, I really understood what meditation is all about. And it's a whole scientific process of accessing your subconscious mind, slowing down your brain waves, which we all know from falling asleep. The moment before we fall asleep, that kind of feeling when you're kind of floaty and drifty, you know, mm -hmm. daydreamy, that's when your brain waves slow down. And meditation is about slowing down those brain waves so we can access a subconscious part of our mind where most of the information is stored. 95% of our memory, in fact. So as we're, yeah, that's really interesting, right? So, so like as it, we're speaking. It makes you like think of things that you wouldn't think about if you're not meditating, basically. Gotcha. There okay. you go. Mm -hmm. And people call it, I had epiphanies. People call it, I had downloads. I saw things, you know, mm. like, and then it's a whole spiritual thing, but actually it's just stored in that deeper part of your mind, which you only can access if your brain waves are slower, which happens when you sleep or meditate properly. 
And when we meditate properly, we have conscious access to it, which is really cool because when we consistently are experiencing a certain um, scenario, let's say as a vegan, you face non-vegans and you have debates. And that's a consistent thing. It happens on a daily or on a weekly, right? If you're an activist and you go out on the streets or you talk online to people, it happens on a daily. And your conscious mind, which is 5%, we're using it right now to process this information. We're using the conscious mind. The more something penetrates into the conscious mind, it starts severing. It starts floating back into the subconscious mind. It's kind of like the idea of having a drop of water on a stone and over a year you have a hole in that stone right like continuous drops on a stone at some point it goes so deep within that it's through the stone possibly um and so i work with these things i work with going to the deeper roots because the subconscious mind is where our body usually acts from and where we have these automated responses, which can be anger or frustration, and then we blame and shame other people. And when we can get to that root, compared to just thinking of I shouldn't be I shouldn't be when we can get to that root of Oh, there were like these 25 experiences that I had in my life, or maybe just one <laughs> a super traumatic experience. Let's say you had a debate with a butcher. Like my mm. first debate on streets with, with, was with two butchers, fresh vegan, oh, wow. fresh activist. I had two butchers and they went in a fight with me. So that sunk in and that created anger in my subconscious mind, which kept replaying over the years after on. And I think this is where the approach can help us to really get that root of anger and start releasing it because once we identify it where it's coming from we can have an active conversation with the event an active mm. interaction with the event and start releasing it right gotcha gotcha um yeah i wonder if uh if back in the day before we had like smartphones internet so much tv and stuff if people just naturally meditated because there wasn't other, you know, other things to do, like just throughout lives. Like we're just not meant to be so distracted by everything that just, uh, d trying to think of, Hey, what do I want to do right now? If you don't have a phone and TV, you just go for a walk and then you see a stream and you see some trees and, and so you, your brain's just naturally meditating without you trying to, but now we have so yes. many distractions. Yeah. Uh, it's so weird. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Agree. <laughs> it's, it's crazy because there's so much good in some of the technology, like conversations like this. Um, you know, I don't know if you listen to audiobooks, but I love listening to audiobooks and listening to podcasts and hearing different conversations. But it's hard to figure out when, how much is too much, like when to turn the devices off. It's almost like you have to put yourself on a schedule or something. Uh, what do you do to uh, cut back on it? I guess you go surfing. When you go surfing, you can't have a TV <laughs> with you. So um, exactly, yeah. Well, surfing it is one of these practices where I am completely isolated from any technical devices, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and where I truly go often into certain meditative states of pure in the moment awareness. Right, and I have to mm -hmm. be because if I'm not, the wave is going to smack me in the face, and I'm going to get hurt which happens a lot too, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Right? Um, but what else can one do when we're, you know, when we're in a room like we both are right now and we have the screen in front of us and then there's a smartphone that is next to us. There are mm -hmm. certain um, hacks and tricks that I also teach on. I call them integration practices, which means we integrate uh, mindfulness practices and we create more spy, uh, space and time for them. Um, but let's kind of like fast forward towards the end of this process. Let's say if I worked with somebody for 12 uh, weeks, which is usually the minimum that it takes to, to create a completely new uh, structure of habits and a new structure of uh, self uh, image, a deeper level of self love is when we discover this deeper layer of self love and integrate that pattern of what would love do what would me as my best partner or as my husband, as my wife do for me now. Mm -hmm. And when we can start acting from that point, 
will understand what's truly best for us and will allow ourselves, will give ourselves more permission to act from it. So let's say you've watched a Netflix movie and then another one starts streaming and you're going for a second one or like a series and you watch five episodes and then it's 2.30 in the night. I bet a lot of us can relate, right? Mm -hmm. um, at some point when you, let's say, meditate and you have a meditation practice and you know these brainwave states, you'll notice that your brain waves are in high beta, which is a, a fast brainwave state and very engaged. And you'll notice that your body is tensed up You'll notice that you might be warm, especially around your head area. Your skin might be um, red. If you have uh, more bright skin, the skin color might turn more red. And you'll start noticing these things. And once you notice, you're like, oh, it's been too much. Like, I got to counter. I got to relax for a minute. And if you go straight to sleep, it still might stay in there. So by applying something that comes from, I love myself, so I'm going to allow myself to apply a proper meditation now or just a five minute breathing pattern to relax that mind to process what i've seen in these series before i go to bed um this is where we start mastering our habits and create a non-addictive pattern to the technical world which allows us to just you know receive and consume what truly serves us because there's a lot of things that serve us, like our communication, our talk right now. This is really great for people to listen to. So do you love yourself enough to notice when it's time to do something different? I think that's what happens at the end of the road. Yeah, for sure. That's wonderful. I like that. Um, awesome. Well, it's looking like we're almost out of time here with this call. It ends in a few minutes. Um, so yeah, this is great talking. Um, do you want to go ahead and say um, some things about how people can find you, a uh, website or ways that they can email you or anything? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm very active on Facebook. So if you search for my name, which is J-U-N-F-U-C-H-S, June Fuchs, you will find my Facebook profile. And if you're vegan, send me a friend request and I'll accept it. I have a great Facebook group on there as well. It's called the Vegan Mental Health and Mindfulness Academy. And as the name says, it truly is an academy because in the Facebook group, I have um, a structured guide section with trainings on elevated activism, on mental health and on mindfulness. So it's basically a free center of resources within Facebook. Awesome. Um, that's where you can reach out to me fastest. Obviously, I do have a website uh, which is linked in my Facebook profile. You'll find it if you go through Facebook. And uh, I also do share a newsletter for everybody who's like, oh, I like this June guy. I want to be more close to him and be in the inner circle. I have a newsletter, which is also presented on my website, which is uh, junefuchs.podia, P-O-D-I-A dot com. I'm sure you're going to link that in the show notes. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> Amazing. Right. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for talking. Have a good one. You too. Thank you so much.